All right. Well, thanks everybody for your patience uh, and welcome and good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Heather Simmons. I'm with the Washington Department of Ecology in the Central Region. I'm calling today from Yakima, Washington. I'm going to introduce today's speakers and also help track your questions and make sure they all get answered. Katie and Judy are also joining us today and uh, they'll also be helping with uh, tracking the questions. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Okanagan Conservation District and was made possible by a grant from the Washington Department of Ecology's Terry Hesman Account Program and with assistance from the Yakima Basin Fish and Wildlife Recovery Board. It's also being sponsored by Populous, the Columbia Basin Riparian Planting Partnership that hosts the Eastern Washington Riparian Planting Symposium each year. We are very fortunate to have two pretty amazing speakers today, Julie Vanderwall and Chris Hogue, that have organized this webinar for us. This webinar is part two of a four-part series focusing on stream bank soil bioengineering and other planting and restoration techniques. Julie Vanderwall has worked at the intersection of environmental science and education for over 20 years. She graduated from the British Columbia Institute of Technology and Environmental Technology and from Barstow College in Child Development and Education. Julie worked for a decade as conservation coordinator for the Okanagan Highlands Alliance, coordinating education and restoration programs. As part of that work, she led the efforts to apply and evolve the beaver dam analog weaving and placement techniques to successfully aggrade the deeply incised Triple Creek stream bed in Okanagan County. This effort inspired her to pursue hybridizing BDA methods with establishing bioengineering treatments, which led her into a collaboration with Chris Hogue with this and other projects. While managing noxious weeds for stream and wetland restoration projects, as well as at her home in the Okanagan Highlands, Julie has explored non-herbicide methods of reestablishing thriving native plant communities in diverse environments. She currently teaches STEM and greenhouse management at the Orville Junior and Senior High School in Okanagan County, involving students in hands-on restoration. And also joining us is Chris Hogue. He's been working on riparian and wetland systems for over 40 years and is the author of over 120 technical papers on applied planting techniques for riparian and wetland ecosystems. He's been working with stream bank soil bioengineering techniques for 37 years and has developed two practical field manuals on bioengineering and over 100 papers describing this, these techniques, how to install them, materials needed, matching riparian species with appropriate stream bank zones and management after installation. Chris was formerly the project lead of the Interagency Riparian Wetland Plant Development Project for the USDA NRCS Plant Materials Center in Aberdeen, Idaho. Chris retired at the end of 2009 and opened up a small consulting business. He has worked, taught, and consulted all over US, Canada, Mexico, and also made two trips to Afghanistan to provide technical assistance to the Afghan Ministry of Forestry and Range. This webinar is part of an ongoing collaboration with Chris and Julie to consolidate Chris's years of experience and Julie's uh, on data, photos, and documents of techniques, making lessons learned more accessible to practitioners, which we all greatly appreciate. And with that, I'll hand it over to Julie. All right, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, Chris and I are both really excited to be here today. It's been, it's been a really exciting process too, just putting this all together and having this opportunity. So thank you. Um, so today's topic is riparian species selection and collection. So um, we're talking about what you know, how do we figure out what species we're going to plant where, and then how do we go ahead and obtain those plant materials? So first of all, you know, where do I start with species selection? You've got a project, you're trying to figure out, you know you need to plant, but what do you plant? So we always talk about the right plant in the right place, but what does that mean? So, you know, one strategy is to choose a basic reference site, um, looking for a healthy spot in your watershed, checking for these components and then comparing them with your site, you know, the soils, the hydrology, the climate, and then selecting similar collection of species for your restoration site. Um, and you can consider this a starting place for choosing species. I think that as practitioners, um, those of you who have gone through this process, you've probably um, realized that it, it's not a perfect uh, strategy and it's just really a starting place. Now, what we're hoping that you can do is uh, utilize this to give you a um, sort of a stepping stone. Uh, again, Julie, like Julie says, there's, it's not perfect, but uh, it gives you a place to start. 
So then what if you can't find a reference site? You know, a lot of times we can't. Um, so one suggestion would be to spend some time in your watershed and the surrounding area, document the riparian species that are present and what stream bank zones you find them growing in. Um, if you weren't a part of the previous webinar in this series, we'd like to really encourage you to go ahead and check it out online. Um, Heather sent out the link in the previous email. I'm sure she can send it out again because we cover the stream bank zones in more detail there. Um, but that can be a really great tool for matching up um, species that you encounter and deciding how and where to plant them on your site. Um, so then consider using some of those species in those same zones on your site. Um, and then looking for sites that have similar elements of ecological function. So for example, in the lower right, you can see um, this was a reference point that we used for a project when I worked with the Okanagan Highlands Alliance that had this kind of sinuosity that we were trying to aim for on our project site. And so we just used that as a point of reference, even though the rest of the site was degraded and it couldn't function full on as a reference site. It did provide that reference information in terms of like what our sinuosity was that we were aiming for. So, and then th the thing is to really choose species that will thrive in a variety of future conditions because we don't know how things may change um, with climate change or with stream restoration with the water table elevation changing. So just having um, different options so that all your eggs are not in one basket hydrologically or climate wise. One thing I'd point out is when we talk about the watershed, uh, the chances of finding a good reference site uh, is, is difficult. Um, you have to look uh, in the you know, the valley you're in, you may have to go to an adjacent valley in the watershed uh, and look, uh, you may have to go upstream, you may have to go downstream. And uh, it, some of that you can do in the office, looking at aerial photos, uh, where you can uh, sort of identify areas that might be good to check. Uh, it'll decrease the amount of running around that you're doing. Uh, but uh, remember, it's, it's not gonna be necessarily right where you're at. You may have to look further afield. Right, for sure. Okay, just having a glitch with my computer. There we go. So, um, so what if you get to a site and you're looking at all the species there, but you're having trouble identifying the willows? What are your options then at that point? Chris, do you want to cover these three types? Yeah, so basically, if you look at this, it's a real simple way to do this. And uh, basically, there are three types of willows. There's a creeping type, shrub type, and tree type. And if you can't identify what you're, what you're looking at, uh, try and put it into one of these three classes. Uh, the creeping type is you know, a heavy thicket of stems that grow, uh, it's a very large root system, and that's coyote willow, Salix exigua. And exigua is, is the only creeping type that we have here. Um, so it'll be pretty quick to figure that one out. Shrub type, this is one where we're looking at a shrub, maybe up 10, 12 feet, something like that. Uh, it usually has multiple stems uh, that uh, um, don't get very large in diameter, usually one, two, three inches in diameter. Um, and this is one that uh, is, is good for you to figure out because that'll go into uh, some of the sites we'll talk about. And there's a tree type, which is basically a tree that has a single stem it, it grows very large, has a really root, deep root system, um, and should be pretty easy to tell. Sometimes the tree type will have multiple stems, but those stems will still be very large in diameter. All right. So then we're looking at what goes where, you know, and, and before we dig into specific species, just, you know, in general of those types, um, if you've got if you've got a site with high water velocity, high debris load, high ice loads, then you're always going to want to use species with flexible stems, as well as deep rooting or rhizominous species because they will re-sprout from the roots if they get broken off by those conditions. Yeah, the the ice loads are one of those, and sometimes you'll see big ice chunks float down, and then they'll settle on the bank and crush the willows. And um, you know, over time, of course, it'll melt. And it just depends on how long it's sitting on top of the willows. Uh, many times the willows will come back up, maybe slowly, but they'll come back up again. The debris load's a little bit different. That's when a big old uh, log floats downstream and lands on the bank or a big root wad or something like that. And uh, the chances of the willows uh, coming up uh, from that are, are low. Uh, so a deep rooting or rhizomatous species will start sending out 
new shoots and, and around the stem, and it'll kind of go up around the stem. So uh, it's uh, the, the flexible stem makes a huge difference in terms of being able to respond to uh, something smashing it, like the uh, water velocity or degree or ice. Right. Okay. And then what goes where? We also want to think about wildlife in the area, whether it's wildlife that's currently present or target species that we're trying to bring back. So here's an example of sharp-tailed grouse sitting in water birch, which is super important for winter forage. And if you don't have that winter forage, you're simply not going to have the sharp-tailed grouse in that area. So you can choose water birch for a number of reasons. Um, one of them may be wildlife restoration as well. Um, and then, you know, in terms of when we're looking at what goes where, we always want to be thinking about diversity for so many different reasons. And I know that a lot of you are already aware of this, so we'll cover it briefly. But for folks who are new to species selection, we're, we're cultivating diversity because we want ecological function at various stream stage stages. So as the stream goes from low water to high water and back, we want to see um, different functions happening that whole time. And so we need different species in different places to accomplish those functions, whether it's energy dissipation, um, you know, sediment capture, um, velocity, you know, reducing the velocity of the stream, et cetera. Um, and then we're looking at diversity for resilience, whether it's resilience to climate change, pests, disease, that sort of thing. And then we also want diversity so that we can be ready for a variety of future hydrologic conditions. Um, obviously, when we're doing stream restoration, we don't always know exactly where the water table elevation will end up. And so if we choose a variety of different species, you know, we can even plant them more closely together than you normally would because knowing that they won't all thrive in the future conditions, at least some of them will. And that comes back to not having all your eggs in one basket. One of the things we uh, usually talk about when we're talking about uh, wildlife needs is looking at limiting factors. Um, the best way to handle that is to go and look at the species that you're working with and identify what is the limiting factor that's holding the population down. Uh, once you identify what that limiting factor is, then you can go out and plant uh, roosting trees, or you could plant nesting cover, or you could plant uh, food or water sources or something like that. So limiting factor is a good way to handle that. Right. OK. So we'll just take a moment to look at the stream bank zones, because these can also guide species selection. And again, if you didn't catch the previous webinar, please check it out online because we're going to be referring back to these zones frequently throughout this presentation. And that will help kind of put the puzzle pieces together. Just remember when you're looking at this little cartoon is that um, the size of the various zones doesn't mean anything. It's just the, the, the picture. Um, and each site that you go to, you're going to have to look and see if you can identify what those zones are how big they are, if one's missing, and that's always possible. Um, so, you know, don't look at this and say, oh, it's always going to be like this. So uh, you have to go out and you really have to pay attention to what it is and, and uh, uh, what identifies each one of these. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about some general guidelines um, for the various zones. So if you see there's a blue circle around the bank zone in that top graphic, this is an area where you want to use flexible stems, um, plants that are short in stature, rhizominous species work really well um, because you have a lot of flooding that takes place um, at that elevation. And then moving up a little further into the lower part of the overbank zone, you still want flexible stems, you still want small diameter species, but you can look at putting things like dogwood, uh, shrub birch, small alder, you know, a variety of different willows, but you still are going to be getting some flooding. And so you want those flexible stems. You do not want to be planting trees or large stemmed willows here. Yeah, and so think about it in terms of how much velocity is coming in the channel. And they remember the toe zone and the bank zone are within the channel. And so you want something that can uh, flex when the high velocities hit it, um, and that the wheels will, the stems will flex and, and lay down, come back up again. And then of course, when you get out to the overbank zone, that's the floodplain. And as the water comes out, out of the channel and floods out across the floodplain, what we really need is roughness to be able to slow the velocity down, allow sedimentation to occur, and to reduce erosion potential. So um, the, that's the way you're designed to do that. And if you, if you try and get a large tree or a very large shrub in there, it's not going to flex nearly as much. And most likely, if it's a bad uh, uh, overbank 
situation, then uh, it'll rip it out of the bank and cause a lot more damage than what you're hoping to do. Great. So continuing up into the over the upper overbank zone, um, you want to use your larger riparian woody species here. So you're getting into your large shrubs and your smaller trees, your mid-sized willows. Um, you can still put your, your will willows in your dogwoods here. Um, and then as you get into the lower transition zone, the next zone kind of uphill, um, you can start using multiple stemmed willows and other species all the way up to tree type species. So your larger willows, um, your alders, your birch, and then you can even start introducing single trunk species such as cottonwood. So just think about it in terms of uh, the overbank zone at the upper end is where we're starting to transition from lots of water to not much water in the upland. And so what we're trying to do is sort of uh, get a, uh, a gradated uh, level of uh, species on that. So each one gets a little bit bigger. What we're really trying to do in these two situations is get shade on the water. And shade on the water, of course, is critical for um, fish habitat. Uh, it also, these also, the bigger ones will provide a lot more root systems that are deep and uh, pretty, pretty big in diameter. So as a combination with the smaller uh, stem willows uh, that have a, a little bit uh, finer root system, it gives you a big uh, tie down in terms of the uh, soils. Nice. Yeah. So, um, these plant materials, you know, you have certain zones that you're aiming to install them in, but with some of the treatments that we'll be suggesting, um, they may be installed through several zones. And so they may extend beyond their optimal growing zone because, for example, maybe you want the base of the, of the cuttings to be in the water so that that plant can be hydrated and sprout and grow. So you will see some of these species extending throughout other zones as well as part of the installation. Yeah, and so it, it just is, uh, it's like when you're putting in uh, a willow on the bank, you, what you're trying to do is go four inches into the bed so that you're in the water all the time, and then run up the bank to a foot over the top of the bank. And, uh, and that way you can get, so you're actually in three zones there. And uh, it's just, uh, but it's just getting water from the toe zone. Its main growth is in the bank zone, and you're getting sunlight in the top. Right, so now we're gonna look more specifically, um, having those general guidelines in mind at who's who and who goes where in terms of specific species. So we're gonna share some easy usable techniques for identifying um, shrubs in the winter, um, which is typically when we're harvesting our dormant cuttings and then how these species root, the ease of propagation, the soil textures that each species will grow best in and we'll provide some example photos to help you um, see what we're trying to convey. Sounds good. Okay, so let's jump into some specific species. Um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with cottonwood, so I'm not gonna go over describing it too much, but the, the old bark tends to be grayish brown and really deeply furrowed, the younger growth being more yellowish gray. And this is, you know, we've got the transitional zone circled here in the upper right, just to show you and remind everybody that that's the appropriate place for a tree type species such as cottonwood. Sometimes what you'll see with that one is that uh, um, you'll see those right on the edge of the stream and that doesn't necessarily mean that they started growing there. It could be that the bank eroded back to them. So just keep that in mind. Right. So how do you decide where to plant cottonwood? You're looking for coarse soils that are well-drained, not ponded areas. So cottonwood is very unlike willow, even though they're both, you know, riparian species that grow near waterways. Um, it roots easily along the entire stem, so you can take cuttings. You want to use the smooth bark sections rather than the older, deeply furrowed sections because they really won't root. Um, and then you want to use in places where shade, shade is needed. So if you have a need for shade, this is a great species to consider. Um, it's also much easier to find really long, straight cuttings from cottonwood than from many of the other species. So if you have a water table that's pretty far down from your ground surface elevation, it can be a natural choice simply because the ease of finding a long, straight cutting, and then you can auger your hole all the way down to the lowest water table and make sure that your cutting is getting the hydration that it needs. 
One thing to remember about black cottonwood is that uh, the smooth bark uh, uh, branches don't occur until it's clear up at the top of the, of the uh, cottonwood. So trying to get cuttings off the top of the tree can be very difficult. Um, uh, I had one guy that liked to shoot them out with a gun, but uh, that, that's not usual. Um, typically what I do is I go to a, a site where you have regrowth and you have uh, new, new cottonwoods coming up that are just the right diameter. And you just go ahead and cut that tree down and use it just like you would with a branch. Um, remember a couple of things about cottonwoods in that um, if you cut out the apical bud, and we're gonna talk more about the apical bud later, but uh, if you cut off the apical bud, then you'll get uh, more growth, uh, more energy going into the buds up and down the stem. And with a cottonwood, if you cut off that apical bud, then you're gonna have a shrubby cottonwood for a number of years afterwards. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll leave that apical bud on, but cut off all the side buds and that'll give us the upward growth and it'll also give us energy to the side growth. Nice. Okay, let's look at Drummond Willow. So we're looking in the bank zone and the overbank zone right now with this one. And so this is very shrubby with an open growth form, six to 12 feet high. The new twigs have this whitish waxy coating on them. And if you rub it off, it's gonna be reddish underneath. And so um, that's a really good way to identify it in the winter. Now Drummond pairs really well with red osier dogwood. They tend to thrive in similar conditions. And so that's kind of how I remember that it's red underneath because it pairs well with red osier dogwood. Um, <laughs> and so you're really only gonna find smaller diameter cuttings with the Drummond. And so one strategy can be to plant multiple cuttings in the same hole, and that will help increase your overall survival because you are gonna have probably higher mortality. So if you really want a Drummond willow in, in one spot, then maybe put several cuttings in one hole. And, and Drummond is just is a great willow to use. Um, again, it's, it's just a little bit higher elevation. So uh, um, it, it, you'll find an area where the, uh, the different species will mesh together. And um, uh, so you'll, you'll get them all growing at the same point. But for the most part, it's going to be a little bit higher elevation. Right. Um, so you can plant Drummond in a wide variety of soil textures. Everywhere, everything from you know fine to coarse textured, as long as the soil is moist and well aerated, it should do well. Um, and tends to be found above Geyer's willow in elevation, so that can kind of help you with selecting where to put Drummond. Um, so this and all of the following willows that we'll discuss all root really well along the entire stem, which makes them great candidates for propagation via cuttings. And some of them are a little harder to, to propagate, but um... But like, like Julie said, most of these that we're going to talk about are easy to propagate. Okay, so red osier dogwood, we all love our dogwood. Um, it's open spreading multi-stemmed, you know, seven to 10 feet. Um, it does spread by creeping stems and natural layering. Um, the bark is smooth. You're going to see prominent raised bumps on the stems. So that can help you with identifying in the wintertime. The bark is going to be blood red. And then the leaves will be opposite. So you can look for signs of where the leaves were and then just make sure that they, the stems are opposite each other and not alternating. Um, and that will be a good clue that points toward red osier dogwood when you're doing your wintertime harvesting. Yeah, just something to think about is that, uh, that the, uh, you can look at the, like Julia saying, the leaf scars on the bark and those leaf scars, if they're opposite each other, that's, that's a good sign. Um, remember too, just a little hint is that if you're, if you're having trouble identifying uh, through the bark or, or the twigs, uh, sometimes what you can do is dig around at the base under the snow and you'll find some old leaves and you can kind of stretch them out and, and look at them and you get a little bit better idea, especially with the dogwood. It's e really easy when you look at the veins on the leaves. So uh, just, a, just something that you can do to extend your uh, base of knowledge. And then how do you choose where to plant dogwood? It prefers to grow in moderately to well-drained coarse textured soil. Um, it's really your best option for shaded areas. So like, for example, let's say you've got a site that's dominated by 
um, just gray alder and you're trying to increase the diversity and it's really well shaded, you could introduce red osier dogwood underneath the alder. It would be able to thrive in there, even though it will also do really well in, in full sun. It's one of the few that will really thrive in the shade as well. Um, and it will root from unrooted cuttings, but it's a little more challenging. So you want to use rooting hormone. You want to wound or stretch the bark before you plant it. Um, do you want to talk about that, Chris? Yeah, the, what we find is because the bark on the dogwood is so thick, it's really hard for the root systems to get through it. And so um, one, what you'll find is if you plant it just like it is when you cut it, uh, all the roots will come out right where the uh, cut is. And so you get uh, that circle of roots right there. Um, and generally what we find is if we can wound it, which is like taking a little uh, hatchet and just uh, doing little little tight uh, or um, shallow cuts in it or a knife, um, then that will uh, allow different areas to grow roots. Uh, what we found that's even easier than that is actually stretching it. And the way you do that is you take your, your stem and you run it across the tailgate of a pickup. And as you run it from one side to the other, over the top, you're stretching the bark. You're not trying to rip it, but you're just stretching it out. And so you can do that really fast and uh, it works amazingly well. Such a great tip. I feel like that's one of my very favorite tips I've learned from you, Chris. Um, <laughs> So because dogwood is challenging to grow from unrooted cuttings, it can be a, a good candidate for transplanting wildlings. They can do really well if you just find small plants out in the wild, bring them to your site. Um, it can be worth that extra effort just because, you know, it is more, they are more difficult than willows to grow from cuttings. Um, booth willow. This is one of our most common willows at mid elevations. It grows really well with gyres, drummond, and coyote. Um, it's a mini branched shrub, so it's got this rounded top, six to ten feet tall. A um, lot of stems that are that are not very big around, less than two inches in diameter. You can one thing that can help you identify it in the winter is that the new wood is bright yellow, so you're looking for that bright yellow color. Yeah, it, it's always interesting to me that they call booth willow booth, and we also have a yellow willow, Salix lutea, that is doesn't have any yellow in the top at all. So go figure. Yeah, that's keep us all on our toes. Yeah. <laughs> so booth willow is the most common on wet coarse soil, but you can also plant it on fine textured soils. So it's pretty versatile, um, grows really well from hardwood cuttings, really easy to propagate. However, it does have the smaller diameter as well. So you're, you know, you might consider again, putting multiple cuttings in the same hole if you're working with booth. We're, we're going to talk more about multiple cuttings in the same hole in the next uh, uh, session. And uh, basically what I'm, what I'm trying to point out there is that if you put multiple cuttings in, remember that there's not a lot of competition because you're putting it right in the water. So water is the main competing factor. So uh, since we don't have that as a competing factor, then uh, what we'll find is that if you get uh, all of them to grow, uh, then you, you're doing great and it's paid for the hole. And if you only get one to grow, Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right. So dire willow. Is anybody else hearing a strange echo? No, I think we're good. No. Okay. Okay. So, um, Geyers is a shrub with lots of straight branches, which makes it really fun to harvest and make cuttings from. Um, it can be 10 to 15 feet tall. Now for identifying it in the winter time, again, these twigs are also covered with kind of a white waxy coating, but when you rub it off, the stem will be green underneath it. And so you can remember gyres is green, both start with G, and that can really help with that wintertime ID um, because if you, unless you were super organized, you know, it's hard to get out to a site and like mark it and make a GPS note that, okay, the gyre willow is right here. I'm gonna come back in February or March or whatever. Um, a lot of times we're just kind of stuck with trying to identify during the winter. So that's why we're throwing in all these wintertime ID tips. Um, this is a, an ecologically important species at mid elevation sites. Um, it's got somewhat of a bigger stature than some of the others, which means it's really important for providing roughness without flattening during high water. So it can stand up to flows more, which of course helps dissipate the energy and, and lowers the velocity and increases the sediment capture that you can achieve. 
And Geyer's is, it's one of the major workhorses. Uh, it's one of those that you can get a little bit larger diameter uh, cuttings. Uh, you can get fairly tall cuttings. Uh, it grows in, in many areas very well. Um, Generally, what you'll find is when you can get a little bit larger diameter, it increases the options on how you plant it. Uh, if it's really thin and small diameter, when you're trying to push it into the ground, a lot of times you'll break it. So this is one that you don't have to worry a whole lot about. It. Nice. So where would you put it? You're looking for drier soils than you would for Geyer or Drummond. Oops, that was a... That looks like a typo. Drier soils than you would for Drummond. Um, you're looking for deep, fine textured soils, and it will root along the entire stem. Yeah, and it's uh, one one little uh, trivia fact is that uh, when you look at the size of the Geyer willows that you're working with, is that the height is equal to the depth of the soil it's in. So it's a good way to tell what kind of soil you're working with how deep it is and how far you have to plant to get to the water table. Okay, and I guess that wasn't a typo, that was just me reading it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Let drier soils for Geyer than you would for Drummond. Okay, Coyote Willow, we all love Coyote Willow. It's like a rock star in stream restoration. Um, and so it's really the only willow that forms a thicket, which has a lot of implications for how we can use it. Um, the new twigs are reddish brown, turning to ashy gray when they're older. Typically, what you're really looking for is that reddish brown color. If it starts getting gray, then it starts putting it into uh, several other species. And so it's a little harder to work with. But uh, generally, it'll be more thickety uh, and where the others will be more shrubby. Um, and uh, coyote willow is one of those that uh, it has two basic um, stem colors. One is gray and the other is green. And what we found over a lot of time is that uh, the green one will actually root better than the gray one. So if you have the option, you definitely want to go with the green bark. And that's easy to remember because green for growth, right? Yeah. Okay, and then just notice the zones that we've circled here. You want to plant coyote willow in the toe zone and the bank zone. It's very well adapted for getting flooded and for capturing sediment and functioning, you know, during high flows. Um, so it's really the only true rhizominous willow, which means that it's the best suited to compete with invasive grasses. So restoration practitioners, you know, we're always kind of banging our heads against the conundrum of reed canary grass. What do you do, you know? Um, if you're trying to increase the diversity of your plant community and you know that you're not gonna completely eradicate reed canary grass, but you're just trying to, you know, increase your diversity, this is an excellent option um, because of the fact that it's rhizominous, it can compete with that grass sod mat situation. And so it's really your best choice. Um, and and um, it, it can really thrive when other willows would kind of get swallowed up by the monster. So um, it likes to grow in moist soils, but you can plant it in anything from silt through gravel. So it's extremely versatile. Um, it's excellent for sediment capture, stabilization in the toe and the bank zones. So this is one too, that it, it has a lot of, of different uh, growth patterns. And sometimes, you know, the average will be six or seven feet in diameter. And, and the diameter of the stems may be, you know, an inch or so, uh, but I've also found them three and four inches in diameter and up to 30 feet tall. So it just depends on where, you at, where you're at and what kind of um, situation you're in with the soils and the fertilizer and the bank and that kind of thing. Nice. Okay, let's look at Pacific or Whiplash Willow. Um, so now we're, if you look at our little graphic, our circle has moved into the upper part of the overbank zone and the transition zone. And this is where you're starting to see more tree-like species. And so if you've got a, you know, overbank transition zone as part of your project area, you know, you might consider Pacific Willow. Um, it can grow up to 50 feet tall. It's like a tree, but it tends to have several main stems like you see in this picture here. Um, the stems can be four to 12 inches in diameter, so much more hefty than the other species we've been talking about. And it's a great choice for places where you need more shade and deeper root systems. 
And one thing about whiplash is it has a very, very good root system that goes quite deep up to 15, 18 feet. And so uh, in putting it in the upper end of the overbank zone is a good way to sort of protect that transition. And, uh, and that's where you can get started with your shade. Oftentimes, if you get too far away, the shade doesn't get on the water. So you can sort of map that out to figure out how high it is and how much shade it'll put down. Don't forget to plant it with your cottonwoods up on top. Mm -hmm. So the lower bark is gonna be furrowed and brown, but the upper branches will be smooth. Um, it's pretty easy to propagate from two to four year old stems, but you're not gonna have much luck with the older stems. Um, you wanna plant it in anything from sandy to gravelly soils. So again, it's fairly versatile. Those are all well draining soils though. Um, it has kind of a medium growth rate, so you may not expect it to just explode and become monstrously huge like some of the other willows can do in a short period of time. But because it's tree-like, it has its own function that it brings to your site and can be really worthwhile. Um, and having those multiple stems will really help break up the force of the water and, and make it less likely that the whole entire tree will be taken down during a, a really high flow event. Yeah, and just, just remember that the best growth that you're going to get is out of the smooth bark sections. And sometimes you're not going to have a whole lot of that. And so you may have to use some of the um, furrowed bark, uh, but it's, it's not going to uh, grow nearly as well. So if you can get into that smooth bark, uh, you're going to do a lot better. Yeah. Okay, so how about water birch or black birch? Um, in our, our graphic here, you can see it's in the bank zone and the overbank zone. Um, it can handle getting its feet wet, which is great. Um, so it can grow up to 30 feet tall. It can be in really dense, crowded stands. Um, if you look at the picture of the bark, it's smooth and it's got these light horizontal pores. Um, and the, the young trees, it'll be almost black bark, but it turns reddish brown with age. And so you can use those indicators for winter ID. Yeah, and, and birch is one of those that, uh, again, you have to remember that, that it won't, won't uh, sprout from hardwood cuttings, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, the other thing is that it is, uh, it's, the leaves are alternate rather than opposite, so you can separate it from a red osier dogwood. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that again, uh, as, a, as when you're out in the field, it's, it's one of those things that you can get confused with really fast. Uh, usually it's going to be taller than red as your dogwood too. So where do you plant it? Um, you can plant it in moist, coarse, cobbly soil, but it will also grow in moist clay soils. So again, it's one of those versatile, easygoing species. It's really helpful for increasing roughness in streams um, because of the fact that it can grow close to the water. It can do some really good work. Um, during some of your flows that aren't quite as high, it will still be in the right place to get flooded. Um, it can provide shade on the water too because it can grow so close, unlike the cottonwoods sometimes. Um, so it's a great candidate for places where you need more shade. Um, it's an excellent wildlife restoration species. So it's kind of like um, multi-purpose, you know, lots of good reasons to plant it. Um, but like Chris mentioned, it does not root readily from hardwood cuttings. So you're looking at containerized plants or wildlings where you, tr you know, transplant something from the wild or even just putting some seed down and hoping that down the road, you'll end up with some water birch that sprouts and grows. So this one, you know, you have multiple stems. They aren't quite as big as, as the uh, whiplash willow. Uh, for the most part, uh, they can get a little bit taller. Um, but those multiple stems uh, along the, the bank uh, will uh, give you a lot of uh, energy reduction on the, on the stream flows. Um, this is one of those plants that uh, uh, you can actually take uh, soil from the base of a mother plant and put it in with your containerized plants and you'll get increased growth. And it's mainly from the uh, the microbiotic uh, populations that you're bringing over from the mother plant. And it helps both of those to grow better. And it can also withstand the radiant heat from cobble. So if you've got a kind of a cobbly situation, um, it, can, it can get too hot for some species, but water birch seems to be okay with that. Okay, how about thin leaf or gray alder? So again, we're in the bank zone and the overbank zone, and we're looking at a shrub that can be fairly tall 
um, has multiple stems. Now with alder, the cones are going to persist through the winter. So if you're trying to tell the difference between birch or alder during winter, that is one sign that can help you out. Um, when would you choose alder? You might choose it where you have um, a lot of beaver pressure because beavers don't prefer to eat alder. Um, I have worked on sites where they did eat it because they were desperate and they will eat whatever they need to when they're desperate, but generally they don't prefer it. So if you have a lot of beaver pressure, you might consider alder. There's a picture of a beaver here from Okanagan Highlands Alliance site. Um, and then you can plant it in a wide variety of soil conditions again. So um, it's, it's just really nice having those options where you're not limited by the, the soil texture. A really fun fact is that alders fix nitrogen. So if you've tested the soil on your site and you've got nutritionally poor soil, um, you can use alder not only for the functions we've been talking about, but to improve your soil. Also, it can handle poor soil. So it's, it's a good option for if you have is issues with your soil quality. Um, and again, because it grows close to the stream, it's really great for adding roughness. Um, it's really hard to propagate it from unrooted hardwood cutting. So it's really better to use containerized plants or wildlings. And again, like Chris mentioned earlier, if you take some soil from the mother tree of alders, you also will see uh, greater success by introducing the the fungi and the, the microbial communities that they prefer and, and that they need. Alder is one of those plants that is is great. It's it's really uh, a lot of people ignore it. They don't think about it as being the potential uh, just because you can't do it from hardwood cuttings. But uh, it is something that is definitely necessary for uh, diversity plantings and and uh, uh, like uh, Julie said, it, it can do some wonders to the soil that you're planting it in. Pretty cool. Okay, so those are some of the more common species that you might be choosing among. Hopefully we've given you some ideas about like how to choose which ones where. Now we wanna talk about some other important plants that are found in riparian zones. We don't wanna forget about the little guys. So here we've got hard stem bulrush, Nebraska sedge, creeping spike rush, Baltic rush. A lot of times we get to be so willow and shrub focused that we don't install these other plants and Chris, maybe you can say a bit about why they're important. So the hard stem bulrush and the creeping spike rush are perfect for the toe zone. It's one of the best, these two are one of the best plants that you can use for the toe zone. Um, the hard stem bulrush will withstand eight feet of standing water for up to six months. And then as that water drops, it will uh, start growing again. It has a very uh, good uh, uh, solid stem that uh, will withstand a lot of velocities. Uh, you can look at the different colors between the green and the yellow, and that'll show you where the average standing water is. Uh, Iliochris is, is one of those that uh, is, is pretty fantastic in terms of being out to uh, reduce the amount of wave action that you get on the bank. Um, it, it'll grow up to three feet tall. It can be totally covered with water for up to six months and continue to, to grow. Uh, the Baltic rush is one of those that uh, it grows in these big patches of green where everything else around it is starting to dry up and turn yellow. A green thing, that's usually Baltic rush and it has a huge root system in it. Nebraska sedge is one of those that will fix uh, nitrogen. It'll break down uh, nitrates to nitrites. And uh, so it's a good uh, pollution uh, plant uh, and it has this huge root system up to 26 miles of roots per cubic foot of soil. So uh, when you think about that, it's you can tell why it's really hard to dig in it because it's got such a root system. Nice. Yeah, so when you're creating your riparian planting plan, um, consider some of these to be a part of it. Um, other plants associated with streams that you might consider, um, quaking aspen, wild rose, variety of native currants in the ribes um, genus, and then basin wild rye. So the rose and the currant, of course, are, are fantastic for wildlife food. Um, the uh, critters will use it quite extensively. Um, basin wild rye is one of the major plants that you would find on the floodplain. It stands up, it can stand up in the winter. Uh, it doesn't bust off and lay down. So 
uh, it's up and ready to go when uh, the spring floods occur before the grasses really start growing. So it's an important member of that. Quake and aspens uh, are, are really nice and beautiful, one of my favorite plants. But um, And the thing you got to remember about quake and aspen is they will not sprout from hardwood cuttings. So you're talking about wildling exclusively or containerized plants. Okay. So that wraps up our section on species selection. And now we're going to transition into collecting plant materials. And you can continue, you can put questions into the chat. We're gonna take all of the questions at the end. Um, so this is kind of part two of our content for you today. So we're not covering seed collection. That would be its own webinar, but in terms of cuttings, like where do I start? So really you start in your office. I know it sounds so exciting, right? Sit down at your computer and think ahead. And so if you write collecting expenses into your grants, then you'll find yourself in a really good position to collect the plant materials that you need in the way that you need to at the right time of year, you know, and have the resources that you need. Um, it's an easy thing to forget, you know, when you're writing a grant. So we just really want to encourage you to include these expenses um, when you're planning your funding. Um, and then the next thing would be your riparian planting plan. Um, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about spring versus fall planting? Yeah, the, the, uh, when you're looking at your planting plan, you have to decide when do you want to plant. And uh, most people think, oh, spring is the only time to plant. It's when you go out and plant your garden and all that stuff. But uh, when you're looking at it in terms of the wild plantings, uh, springtime is when you usually have a lot of water on the ground. So getting into the site with equipment, it can be very difficult. Um, finding the lowest water table of the year would be almost impossible unless you've done some uh, pre-work on it. Um, so you have to sort of think about that. It, it's better, better planting for the, uh, for your crews, but, uh, there's a lot of other things that go into that. Fall planting is one that most people don't think about. And, and, uh, it's actually my favorite planting time because you have a lot more, uh, things that can, uh, you can work with, uh, fall plantings. And when we talk fall, we're talking about after the, the, uh, the leaf fall and uh, just before the uh, ground starts freezing. So usually depending on where you are, October, November, December, or something like that. Uh, and and uh, when you're doing it in the fall, it's a lot easier to find the lowest water table of the year. And remember, well, we'll talk about propagation in, an, in another uh, session. And uh, when you're putting it into that lowest water table of the year, you want 10 to 12 inches into that loss, but you've got to know where that is. So it's always in the water. Um, the other thing that you'll find is in the fall that, well, when you're planting it that late, we're not expecting it to sprout. And so it just sits there. And we used to think, oh, it just sits there and doesn't do anything. And then we did some more research on that and found that the whole time it's sitting there, it's starting to put out root system. And so you have this root system that's starting to come up even before it starts sprouting. So it's a, a real positive time of the year to plant. And if you're feeling uncertain about any of that, you can always plan to do some spring and some fall planting and then compare for yourself. So you, you know, you, your eggs aren't all in one basket again, but definitely some real benefits you know, to, to fall planting. Um, and just, you hope that the ground doesn't freeze too soon on you. You get a nice window between dormancy and the freezing, but, but Typically in, in Okanagan County, um, I've had really good luck with that window being available. Um, and then, okay, so what's next after you've made your riparian planting plan? Um, your recon, right? You need to locate your plant materials. So you're looking at, do I wanna harvest wild versus nursery raised stands? Um, you wanna research the hydrology of your site, knowing how your access is gonna be like, which can be related to the hydrology. Um, your timing, you know, and then your land ownership. Of course, you always want to have permission from wherever you're gathering. So one thing about the wild versus nursery raised stands, uh, we found over time that uh, over a lot of years of planting is that the wild collections that you get are oftentimes good, but in some cases, what you have to watch out for is that um, if you're collecting from a stand that is uh, being affected by no water or lots of water or some other uh, type of stressor that the cuttings that you get are not going to be very vigorous. 
and we found over time that that uh, we don't get nearly as as uh, good of uh, establishment success uh, with those stand uh, cuttings collected from the stress stands as we do with uh, good stands that are in in good areas. Um, the nursery uh, raised plants are we're finding better. Uh, and a lot of times the nurseries will put in a stooling bed where you can go in and you can cut the uh, same size cuttings throughout the, the year or throughout the summer and then uh, plant those. Uh, and remember that there the nurseryman is, is uh, uh, irrigating and spraying and fertilizing and all that stuff. So you have very high uh, vigor uh, cuttings. And so it works really well in that sense. Okay, so next you might ask yourself, well, should I collect dormant or green hardwood cuttings? Do I really have to collect dormant cuttings? Because I'm in a, maybe you're in a pinch and you know the timing didn't work out and now it's time to do your planting and everything is leafed out. What do you do? So when we, when we talk about it, remember the dormancy is between leaf fall and bud break in the spring. And that's when you're going to get the best plants that are, that are going to establish the best. Um, sometimes uh, it, it depends on, like Julie said, there's a lot of different factors. Usually the one that hits us the most are uh, permits. And sometimes, you know, they won't give you a permit to, to plant while the fish are migrating. And so a lot of times, like in Oregon, that'll be August. And so there aren't many dormant plantings that you can find in, in August. So that's when, like Julie said, you may have to go to something like green cutting. All green cuttings are, are cuttings that have already leafed out. They're, they're leafed out. And what you're going to do is you're going to process those just like you are dormant cutting. You're going to take off all the side branches. You're going to take off the top two feet and you're going to angle the bottom. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. But uh, generally what we find with uh, green cuttings is the survival is not very good. And uh, <laughs> we found that uh, uh, you can, and some people have found much lower uh, survival rates than 20%. Some people have found a little bit higher. Um, I think it's just how the gods look at it and, and uh, smile on you. So it's uh, one of those things where uh, if you if you're in that situation, then plant a whole bit, a whole bunch more cuttings. Okay, so next logistics, you need to have tools that are sharp, the right variety. Have, make sure you have extras. You're going to be processing cuttings and bundling them, so you need to plan for that. Plan for staging, stacking your bundles for transport. Who's going to transport them? How are you going to store your harvest, st store your cuttings during your harvest window as well as afterward? So just a lot of different logistics to have in place before you go out and make any cuts. And then your labor. And this comes back to grant writing again, like make sure you plan for enough help when you're budgeting and planning your steps. And maybe you can talk a little bit about labor, Chris. Yeah, labor is one of those that I find that that is the make or break. And uh, you got to have enough people to be able to do what you want to do. And if you're using volunteers, they are great. They, they have a lot of heart. But uh, generally, uh, they'll start uh, getting really tired. Um, if you're looking at two days of planting, generally what I do will be to have some signed up for one day and some signed up for the other day. Uh, not normally uh, a volunteer that would work both days because they get really tired. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, what we found is uh, contractors. And you get people that are uh, tuned to this. They, they know what they're doing. They can plant. Uh, unbelievable amount of cuttings in a really rapid time and oftentimes they're well worth any kind of money that you're going to pay them um, so uh, you know that's and when you're putting together your your labor force uh, what I usually do is put them into teams and I have two cutters and uh, two process processors are basically the people that go through and they cut the side branches off they cut the top off they angle the bottom and then uh, uh, wrap them up into bundles and then uh, then you have two haulers would be the absolute minimum probably more like four haulers because that's a lot of work and people get tired out in a hurry so you might want to look at maybe rotating uh, be between the various process or the various uh, jobs there nice 
And then of course you want to make sure you have help in place to, with storing and, and soaking the cuttings and all the next steps that will happen. Okay, so next question, can I harvest from only one plant? You know, sometimes you might just come upon only one plant and you're interested in, in propagating it. So you gotta think about sex and the single willow. Make sure you get both male and female specimens. So the short answer is no, it's, it's not a great idea to harvest from only one plant. It might be then you only have male cuttings or only female cuttings and what kind of stand are you establishing? How productive is it gonna be in the future? So harvest from as many different mother plants as you can from the same species on the same site in the same zone. Um, and this will reduce the chance of collecting only male or female. And then how much is too much? How much can I harvest from one plant? Um, no more than one third of one plant should be harvested. So always harvest around the mother plant, go all the way around. Don't harvest all from one side. Keep aesthetics in mind. You know, you want to leave things looking nice when you're done. And that's one of those that, that uh, you, you try and look at it in terms of you don't want to cut off the, the whole side of the plant because it looks really strange and people are going to be looking at what you're doing and where you're doing it and what you leave it like. So uh, it's good to just uh, make sure that you're aware of the mother plant and make sure that you harvest all on both sides, all the way around it, from the middle, that kind of thing, and, and leave it looking at least relatively nice. If you like cross-country skiing, it's really fun to combine willow harvesting and skiing. That's what that picture is. It's a great time of year for it. Um, so how do you make the cuttings? Uh, you're always going to collect from healthy, vigorous stands. So stands that are stressed, either too little water, too much, they're not going to root as well. Um, collect cuttings that are disease and insect free. So if you see anything weird, you're like, ah, oh, that looks kind of funky. Just don't, don't collect from that. Um, watch for herbicide spray on the side of the roads. I'm, I'm, I'm always pulling over on the side of the road to grab willow cuttings, but I've learned that um, if half of the shrub is like sprayed with herbicide, I probably shouldn't harvest from the other half. Talk about a stressed plant. Yeah. Um, it's just a convenient location when you're on your way somewhere and you need some willow cuttings for some kids or whatever. <laughs> but um, make sure the cutting is alive. You want to talk about the fingernail test, Chris? Yeah, generally, uh, when you look at these cuttings, when you're when you're harvesting them, a lot of times what you'll find is that the, the guys that are cutting are going to just cut and it's up to the processors to kind of go through and, and identify which ones are alive and which ones aren't. I mean, there's uh, when it's when there's no bark on it, it's pretty easy to tell. But if it still has bark on it, a lot of times uh, what you have to do is if you take your thumbnail and run it up the bark and if it kind of goes into the to the bark, it kind of makes a little furrow into the bark, that's alive. And generally, if you take your thumbnail and you run it up the bark and it doesn't go in, that one's dead. So uh, that's something for you to think about when you're looking at the stand and you're looking at all the different willows you have. Nice. Okay, um, Chris has kind of already go through, gone through these steps. So I'm gonna keep this really brief in the interest of time. But um, you wanna make sure you have the right tools. You wanna to cut close to the ground, make a flat cutting at the bottom, not an angled cut because otherwise you're leaving like a dangerous pointy thing in the ground. Um, you can add the angle when processing, which will help identify which end is down when you're planting. Um, trim the top off, trim the side branches off, bundle them up into bundles of 50 or more, and then tie in two places for easy transport. And those are kind of your seven steps to making your cuttings once you're out on the ground. And we'll talk more about that later. Okay, how do you label? Um, you always want the date, the collector, the location, the elevation, the stream bank zone that you got it from that will help guide where you place it on your site. And then if you know the species, of course you wanna write that down. But if you don't know the species, um, just write everything you know, everything you can observe about this plant and where it was growing, its habit, whatever information you can put on there because it's gonna to be too late once you leave the site to be able to recall that information. Um, use moisture proof labels. I've absolutely learned this the hard way, like more times than I would care to admit. This is my lovely label on the right um, that I wrote on paper and I have no idea what species of willow that is now. Um, so we have plastic, a Sharpie. And you also might want a spreadsheet to create a record of your collection so that that label isn't the only record. And also you have all your info in one place about everything that you've collected. 
the spreadsheet is one of those that um, I didn't use when I first started and and uh, then I started using it and, and it made a huge difference because then say you want to find out how many willows you've collected from a certain site because you might have a project in there. It's really easy to go back to the spreadsheet, figure out how many you collected there, uh, what species you collected there, and it's all searchable. So. Uh, as Julie has taught me over time that uh, that you can do a lot of searching on a spreadsheet and come up with a lot of information pretty easily. It's a good record to show how many willows you've collected for a grant writing situation. Something like that. Yep, and you can always have a volunteer take inventory in your storage area if you don't have time to do it while you're collecting. Okay, how long should the cuttings be? They need to be long enough to reach down to the lowest water table and then extend above any competing vegetation shade. They also need to be low enough to go below any competing vegetation root mass. So whichever is lower the, the competing root mass or the water table. So that is what tells you how long to make your cutting. So there's no like table you can look at or recipe you can look at. You have to look at your site and your conditions. Um, you want three quarters of your cutting in the ground in order to develop enough root mass to support the part that's above ground. So that again is gonna dictate your total length. And then you want at least one to two buds above the ground. It will be more than that if you have shade problems and you're trying to reach above the shade. There are a lot of things that go into the length and uh, as, as Julia uh, talked about in these, uh, a lot of times it's uh, uh, the, big, the biggest part of that is that what species you're collecting and how big it is. Uh, as to how much you can go. Uh, three quarters of, of the cutting in the ground, there's been a lot of research that was done in Canada on this that showed that you need about that much root mass to, in order to support all the leaves and, and new stems that are coming up. So um, that's something for you to think about. The, the other thing to think about is if the water table is very close to the surface, you may still need to go down two feet to get below the root mass of the competing vegetation. Yeah, so whichever is Okay, how about diameter? Um, your minimum diameter should normally be three quarters of an inch. It, you may have to use smaller with certain species, but you may get less consistent results. Your average diameter would be about one to two inches as much as possible. Your maximum diameter is probably 10 inches. That's pretty huge. Um, it's gonna be species dependent. So there's no one size fits all. So generally, the thing to remember about this is that um, when you look at a cutting, the, the diameter is going to dictate how much energy it has. Uh, when you get into the dry east side, um, half inch is probably not enough. It just doesn't give you enough energy to get it through uh, some real rough times. So uh, on the dry side, I, I really push for three quarters of an inch. The other thing about that three quarters of an inch to one to two inches is that uh, when you're installing them, it's a lot easier to push them in the ground and they don't break, as I mentioned before. Um, the, but that's all species dependent. And when you get into booth willow or, or drum and willow, you're not gonna have a whole lot of choice. Um, I wanted to mention whips. A lot of people use the term whips and they don't really understand what the term whip means. Uh, it's misused a lot. Uh, basically, it's defined as current year's growth. And when you're talking about current year's growth, it's about as big as a pencil. So uh, you can think about it as not having, it's got a lot of rooting hormone, but it doesn't have a lot of energy. So it, it can be effective in high precipitation areas that uh, really uh, uh, get things growing in a hurry. But generally on the dry side, what you're going to do is you're looking at two to seven year old wood. Um, because it's going to be a little bit bigger diameter, it's going to be a little firmer. Um, it depends on species and climate, of course, but uh, uh, that's the best recommendation is two to seven. Nice. Okay, and then how do you treat the ends of your cuttings, the flat ends on top? You want to seal the top two inches or so with latex paint. Um, this will help retain moisture. It will help you identify which way is up, especially of volunteers who are helping you plant so they don't get planted upside down. And the really fun part is you get to color code by species. So you know, like here, I've got my blue coyote willow and my orange Pacific willow and my white drum and willow. And then anybody can go out there and help with, you know, survival rate survey or what, what have you. It's super easy to identify and to find your cuttings. So lots of reasons. Yeah. Yeah, and you can use different colors, uh, uh, like like Julie says. Uh, she's a lot more organized. I just grab whatever's in the paint locker and put them. Uh, 
Uh, as you can see, you're just taking a bundle of willows uh, it's tied already that has already been processed and just take it into the bucket and put in a couple of inches of, of paint in there and just dip it and then pull it out and turn it upside down, uh, right side up and uh, it'll drip down a little bit, but that won't hurt it at all. Uh, so it's a, I like it too, because it's very easy to find the cuttings when you're doing your evaluations, uh, like uh, Julie already said. It's like having flagging tape on. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about soaking cuttings. We're getting close to the end of our content here for people who are tight on time, just to let you know. Um, we did get a late start, so we're ending a little late as well. But um, why do we soak cuttings? We have lots of reasons. They're bulleted here. So we need to hydrate the cutting. We need to swell the root primordia. We want to establish, we want to like really assist with establishment when we have dry conditions like we normally do here in Eastern Washington by reducing the water stress. And then we're increasing shoot and root growth. We're increasing drought tolerance because they're going into their new planting situation fully hydrated and we're lowering mortality. So lots of good reasons to take the time to soak. It does require a little bit more planning ahead, um, but soaking all of your cuttings will increase your establishment success. One thing about this one is the, the root primordia. And uh, what we like to do is we like to make sure that we can uh, uh, soak them long enough so that the roots start coming up to the to uh, emerging from the bark. And we don't want them to emerge from the bark. So um, if they do, then in the lower right-hand corner of that picture, you'll see a whole bunch of what we call water roots, which are the white roots. And uh, when those start growing out, when you put that into the ground, you'll knock them off. Almost, it, it almost never fails. And uh, um, if you knock those off, that means that you've used up some of the energy in the stem. So it has to grow new ones again. And when it does that, um, it's going to use more energy. If it doesn't have all the energy in the stem that you need, it's going to die. So uh, it's just something to think about. And we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so how do we soak our cutting? We want a cut, a fresh cut end to increase water uptake from the bottom. We want to soak them for 10 to 14 days. Um, the easiest thing is usually to soak half the cutting because you can just set it in a garbage can or what have you. But if you want, you can soak the entire cutting and that will extend your planting time because they won't try to start growing as soon if they're completely submerged. So roots will start to emerge after about 17 days. So you don't want to push your soaking to the point where you've got roots emerging. Yeah, and that's one of those that, again, it's, it's, th these are approximate and, and you want to definitely keep your eye on the, on the cuttings that you have soaking when you hit that 10 day or uh, 12 day uh, mark, because if you start seeing them come out, you need to get them out of the water immediately. Um, it's, the uh, remember that cutting making a fresh end on the uh, cutting off a fresh end is really important. It's just like when you get a Christmas tree at a lot. Uh, the first thing they do is cut off the bottom of the Christmas tree so it is able to uptake water easier. Yep. Here's another option if you've got a fish hatchery runway nearby, it can make an excellent spot for willow soaking. So make friends with your fish folks. Maybe some of you are already fish folks, so you have an in. <laughs> Um, how do we store our cuttings? So Chris always recommends storing them dry, no wet burlap, no wet newspapers. And so um, I'm looking at doing some experiments with my students because I've had to use coolers that have lights on all the time. And so I've used black plastic bags and we're gonna do some experiments and see if we have issues with mold and mildew because that can be a problem. But um, you know, the safest way I guess would be to store them dry so that you don't get that mildew growing. Um, you want it to be dark and your optimal temp temperature is gonna be 34 to 38 degrees, um, then you can store them for one to one and a half months. If you need to store them longer, you wanna decrease the temperature to 33 or 34 degrees. You may end up with lower establishment rates, but um, that, you know, that can help you with if you need to store them longer than that. Um, and then you can freeze them to extend the time, but it's not necessary. And what we found is that if you uh, put them in a freezer, you can't extend that time period. So if you're if you're in a in a bind, that's one way to do it. In the Midwest, what they'll do is they stack them outside in ricks, and then let the snow fall on them, and then they stay in the snow until they're ready to plant. 
the last thing I'd say is sometimes you can find a big snow bank up on top of the uh, mountain pass or something like that. You can dig a big hole, throw all your cuttings in there and then pack it down and then just monitor it to see how fast it's melting. That'll do a real good job of storing them. Yep. Um, friends with your local florist and have it in their floral cooler or your grocery store or your local brewery because I've definitely tried all of those as well. <laughs> okay, so that wraps up our species collection section. Wow, we've got a lot of rhymes going on here. Um, so today we've talked about riparian species selection. So where do I start? We talked about reference sites. What if I can't ID a willow? How, you know, how can I describe it um, and understand its growth pattern? Um, what goes where in relation to those stream bank zones and other considerations? And then we talked about important species. We gave you some winter ID tips. And we talked about both shrubby and herbaceous plants and how they both are important to include in a riparian planting plan. Chris, you wanna talk about our collection review? Yeah, we, and we gave you some ideas in terms of um, how to collect your cuttings, uh, what size they should be, and, and some of the things that you need to do uh, when you're putting together your planting plan, office work, go out, get out, uh, out from behind your desk and walk around on the site, look at the soils, look at the vegetation, look at what species are out there, look at the water. Um, all those are going to be important when you're putting the plan together. Logistics, we talked about. Uh, the logistics and how important it is to get all the things you need and uh, especially transportation and then of course labor and labor is going to make or break your whole project um, then collection of the cuttings that we talked about how to do that um, and then uh, the specs for the cuttings what size and all that and then how to store them so that was it in a nutshell nutshell um, Topics in this webinar series. Our first topic was principles of stream bank soil bioengineering. That um, webinar is available online. And then today we talked about riparian species selection and collection. The next one will be about toe and bank zone treatments um, because we put out a survey and that those were the two most um, requested zones that people wanted to learn about treatments for. We're going to include information on pyramidal style live BDAs in our toe and bank zone webinar. And then lastly, we will provide a webinar on choosing the best techniques for your situation. So how do you know what treatments to do where and why? So that's our series in a nutshell. And now we're ready for some questions if you have any. And I'm gonna leave our contact info up on the screen for a bit and then I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can um, see each other hopefully. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, all right. Well, um, I, I, I think I have all the questions down, so I'll try to go through them. But um, I have a couple of other people on that. If I miss anything, let me, you know, feel free to jump in. So the first question, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to ask these in order that they were asked. So for rushes and sedges, are these seeded plants? What kind of site prep should be done to prepare for a seeding? of these species. Also, do these rushes, sedges compete well with reed canary grass? So I'll take that one. Um, so generally seeding of wetland plants like that's pretty hard to do. Um, it's first of all is they float. So when you put them down and uh, they, they'll tend to float away. Two is they need light to germinate. So you have to put them on the surface. You can't drill them in. Um, so uh, generally my recommendation is always if you can do uh, 10 to 12 cubic inch plants, you're going to do a lot better and your success rate is going to be like 100% better. Um, there has been some uh, research that was done in the pot, prairie potholes region that shows that uh, sedges and rushes will, um, they do better on soils that don't have a lot of added nutrients. And uh, the grasses will do much better on those uh, soils that have added nutrients. So um, if you're looking at a native stand and trying to maintain it, uh, there's you, if it has a lot of nutrients in it, there's a good chance it can be overtaken by reed canary grass. Yeah, it, and if I could just add a couple of species that come to mind in terms of competing with reed canary grass. Um, I've seen Scirpus microcarpus um, do really well in reed canary grass environments. Um, you know, it's able to kind of compete for the sun because it's taller. 
Um, that would be like your small fruited bull rush, I believe. Um, and then Carex athroides, I've also seen do fairly well in a reed canary grass environment. So, you know, the question of like, will the sedges be able to compete? I think it really does matter which sedges you choose. And, um, Have you heard of the, the sedge mats that roll out? I, 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 Tell me again, <laughs> what, what was that? Uh, well, so one of my grant recipients, Chelan County, uses sedge mats, which yes. are like pre-planted, pre -planted. I think there's only one nursery right now that offers those, but I could be wrong. Have you, do you have any experience with those? Yeah, we've, we've used them quite a bit, and, and uh, the big key with that is that it works really well with sedges. Um, it's not so good with rushes, and it's not so good with bulrushes um, or eleocris. Uh, it, and when you get those uh, going for you, you want to make sure that you inspect them before you take delivery because uh, sometimes they get in such a rush that they will pull them out of the water before they're fully grown. And if they haven't fully grown in, uh, it, it makes a huge difference on how well they'll do. Um, the uh, hydrology is critical on those and staking them down. Uh, you wanna make sure that you do get there. Um, they, have, they finally put together a little uh, worksheet sort of thing on how to install them. And you wanna read that very closely to make sure that you get them in the right spot. Um, we've done it uh, just on our own and just had a little uh, area that we uh, bladed off and made level and then we rolled out courier fabric into that and then seeded it and then put water in it, let it uh, um, raise the water up to an inch over the top and then let, let it dry down and then raise it again and then let it dry down and then raise it again, let it dry down. And you can actually do your, all your own uh, planting that way. In Europe, they do a lot of transplanting where they'll take small uh, uh, sprigs of it and they'll put those right into the uh, mats. Um, I think it's a good way to do it if you get it in the right uh, hydrology. Do you know offhand uh, any nurseries that, uh, that sell those? Yeah, or there's the one that's in Rexburg that... Uh, uh, oh, I can't. Idaho? Yeah, Rexburg, Idaho. Um, um, I'll think of the name. I can't can't remember right right off the top. But um, the uh, they do have. Uh, and if you looked up uh, um, uh, wetland mats in Rexburg, Idaho, I think you'd find it pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a lot of nurseries that offer them. They may be the only one, but I, I can't remember. But my Chelan County Natural Resources Department uses them a lot. Um, so if you're really interested in them, I could connect you with someone that has used them a lot and knows where to purchase them. But yeah, I would try that Idaho nursery. Okay, so the next question is, if water birch is planted near a cobbled portion of a stream, will it help to keep the water from dropping beneath the cobbles in the summer? No. <laughs> no, it's it's that's not really the the idea behind it. Um, generally, what you'll find is that the water is going to fluctuate no matter what you do, and and the only way to sort of slow that down is if you're using the planting as sort of a I hate to use the word dam, but it's it's where you're where you're creating a little drop and you're backing water up and then that's stored in the side uh, of the banks. Um, so, so that, I heard somebody saying something. Sorry, just like great control. What's that? I thought maybe the word you were looking for was grade control. Thank you, that is the word I was looking for. I was struggling with that one, wow. Okay, great. next one. Okay, oh, and there's a comment, there's comment in the questions that Derby Canyon natives out of Pashastin grows one by two foot sedge blocks. So if anybody's interested in those, it's good. That, that's a great nursery. All right, the next question is have a pre, have, let's see, have a, has a previously cattle browsed site full of teasel. Oh, okay, this is somebody that has a previous, previously cattle browsed site full of teasel, now with coyote willow sprouts everywhere possible this willow could out compete and eventually shade out the teasel? Oh yeah, 
Yeah, the teasel is is really um, its its main habitat is disturbed areas, and so um, the grazing will have caused that disturbance, and the teasel will grow up. But uh, over time, once you get the willows growing, the teasel will just go right on down. Um, one other thing about backing up one for the uh, for the uh, blocks, um, what I do is I just dig up uh, clumps of the different, uh, especially hard stem bulrush and Nebraska sedge. I just dig up one foot by one foot uh, clumps, something that'll fit in a five gallon bucket, and you don't have to pay for uh, the the blocks or the mats. Uh, go down six inches and then put it right into a bucket and haul it over and and then set it into a hole dug in the bottom and, and it'll take off like a shot. So uh, it's easy and it's cheap. Great. Um, next question. Do you have any experience planting with herbaceous plants like common dogbane? I do not. I don't use dogbane. Um, you know, I usually, uh, we, we, what we're looking at is, is more um, herbaceous grasses and grass-like plants. Uh, that's mm -hmm. where the concentration of our efforts are. Okay. Uh, when is it best to re remove invasives from a wetland area? So when is it? When is it best to remove invasives from a wetland area? Uh, I can take that one if you want, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it, so every situation is going to be different, but I would always look at removing seed head as like a first starting place. So if, if anything's gone to seed, go in there with a good quality garbage bag and some clippers, put the bag over the head so that you're not dropping or releasing any seed onto the ground clip off all your seed heads. So now you're, you're not at least, you're, you're not contributing new seed to your site for the next year. And now you're down to your plant and its roots and it's gonna depend on the you know severity of the situation. So to what extent is the plant taking over your site? Um, what plant is it, you know, how bad of an invasive plant is it? How likely is it to become a monoculture? Um, and what's your funding and your labor situation? Um, what's your volunteer situation? Right, so there's a lot of variables and if you wanna talk about it more, you could contact me. But um, I would always recommend getting rid of seed and then I would always recommend practices that will control the weeds by, by developing a diverse native plant community rather than just focusing on going in and taking out the weeds. So for example, Canada thistle, you know, is pretty ubiquitous. Um, it's hard to get rid of. If you, you could get like a huge crew and dig it up and it would just come right back. Or you could, like if it's growing in a grass environment like reed canary grass or whatever other grasses, um, if it was growing in a native grass environment where there were native grasses around, that would be particularly ideal because if you mow it enough times, like five times in a season, you'll start to just see the grasses take over. And so, yes, it's a good idea to remove the Canada thistle, but not necessarily with a shovel. You know, you might implement a mowing regime and see your Canada thistle population drop way back. Now, if it's a reed canary grass environment, it's just gonna become all reed canary grass. But maybe that's advantageous from an access standpoint because you're walking through it all the time and you're no longer walking through thistle while you're trying to restore your site. And then you can look at working on the reed canary grass and getting your native plant population reestablished. So, you know, I think that's a really complex question that we could spend all day talking about, but yes. hopefully that gives you a couple things to think about. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. So you're welcome to reach out to me if you want to discuss your situation. Great. Um, so, well, someone commented that about the third, three quarters below ground and that it sounds like that's a dry side, east side, uh, of the state condition and that on the wet west side they have great success with just a third of the stake in the ground so that's a good thing to point out we have people joining us from both sides of the state and from other states as well that today's talk is somewhat focused on the east side but in many ways applicable to both sides but I didn't know if you wanted to speak to that at all yeah, and actually, uh, the the research that was done in Canada was done in British Columbia, and it's pretty wet. So uh, um, they found that again, that three quarters. Uh, if you're planting a three foot uh, cutting, uh, what you want to do is get at least two feet in the ground, one foot above the ground, sort of thing. Um, and they what they also found was that um, 
if you can get so let me back up a second and say what are the three things necessary to get cuttings to grow on the east side actually you could say on the west side too the three things are water water and water so if you have lots of water on the west side things will grow a lot better than they will on the east side so you know you take up some of the variables that way but uh, generally what you'll find is that three quarters is necessary to get uh, enough root system to be able to support the above ground biomass that you're growing. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, we just have one more question. Uh, if anybody else has more questions, feel free to put them in the uh, message box. But the last question I see is, are there references to how long to soak specific species before they go beyond start of root? So. I guess speaking to like different species, are there different uh, soaking times and, and where could they find that information? I don't know of any information like that. Uh, that's one of those that would be very nice to have, but I've never seen a research project that really addresses that. Anybody looking for Larry's <laughs> What was that, Julie? Julie? Oh, anybody looking for like a PhD project? Uh, go for yeah. it. Yeah. That's right. Great. Uh, someone just asked, do you soak before or after storing? The What you want to do is if you're soaking or if you're storing them dry, you have to soak once it comes out of the cooler. It's mandatory because you're going to start uh, desiccating the, the stem a little bit, but it's a lot easier to move it around and stuff when it's dry rather than wet. And uh, so if you bring it right out of the cooler and into the water and soak it for that uh, 10 to 14 days, um, it, it'll rehydrate like crazy and, and uh, really take off. If you're looking for a sort of a general rule is that uh, what I like to say is uh, you want to uh, soak the part that's going in the ground. So if you're, you know, if you're going in the ground two feet, then I'd soak two feet. Great. Also, if you're soaking in a creek, make sure you put some chicken wire down or something if you've got beavers around, or you might lose all your cuttings. Yeah, I tell you, that's a, I lost 5,000 cuttings that way. It, it, and, and the beaver had the best dam in the whole, in the whole area. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, one more question came in. Did you, did you mention how to prep stems prior to planting? I think they meant planting, angle, cut, angle cutting, bed removal, et cetera. Yeah, so the the prep is going to be when you're after when you're harvesting them. You're going to cut off all the side branches, and you're going to cut off the top two feet of the stem. And uh, the top two feet is where the flowering parts are, so you want to get rid of those because you don't want to flower. Plus, it's a smaller diameter, so if you can cut it down from there, um, then what you're going to do is angle the bottom cut again. That lets you know which end is up. Well, lets your crew know which end is up and which end is down. And if it's sharpened on the bottom one, then you can uh, push it in easier. So um, the paint on the top is a good way to, to uh, uh, be part of that where you're uh, painting the top so that you can identify like, uh, like Julie did with different species. It also lets you know which end is up. Um, it also lets you know um, for, uh, to find them after you're planting. So you're, when you're doing your evaluations, you know, uh, where they are and how much, uh, how many of them are still alive. So between soaking and planting, is there any further prep or they just go straight in the ground? From soaking to planting. Yeah, um, no prep, just in the ground. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, uh, I don't see any one, further one, questions. One other thing, Heather, about that is that um, if you are soaking your plants, and you're getting ready to plant, remember to only take the number of cuttings that you can plant in a day to the field. Leave the rest in your cooler. Don't take the whole thing out because you'll kill a bunch of them. So um, try and figure out, okay, I can plant, you know, 500, 1,000, 10, whatever it is, and, and only take that many. Don't take all the rest of them. When you put them on the site and you're getting ready to plant them, make sure they're in the shade, make sure there's water on them, and make sure it's cool wherever you put them. 
Yeah, the only exception I would have to that is if you have a really sweet spot to soak them entirely on site, then you can kind of move your, you can stage them on site that way, but they need to be cared for. They need to be underwater in a cool spot. Just don't pull them out of the pond early is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, that was a lot of information. I'm sure folks are going to want to refer to this video and to the slides again. So we are going to uh, I'll work with Julie to get the video up uh, online and maybe make the slides a, power, a PDF if that's okay. And, uh, and then I'll send that link out to our uh, email list. If you are not on our email list, just send me an email at heather.simmons at ecy.wa.gov. It's in the comments. Um, and I will add you to our mailing list so that you um, get the link to the video and also announcements of future webinars. For example, we have a webinar coming up uh, in two days that will continue. Uh, we have a different speaker, but he's going to talk about uh, identifying riparian uh, trees and shrubs. So he'll cover probably some of what we heard about today and some additional ones. Um, Stephen Lee with NRCS. So uh, if you don't know about that webinar and would like to know more, uh, send me an email. And thank you, Julie. Thank you, Chris, um, for being with us today and sharing all this great information. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Heather, for helping us. We sure appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. We appreciate that. Yes, yeah. thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for the quick transition to Zoom as well. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's amazing. Way to go, Julie. Well, we have to be yeah. like willows, right? We have to bend and not break like a willow in high water. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Great analogy. <laughs>